Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. How can we do a better job with apologetics? Is it possible to stop being just a fax machine? Let's discover some concepts that will better position you to always be ready with that answer. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Beyond the Facts with Jay Siegert. Hello, welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Jay Siegert, is an author and international speaker and holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. He currently serves as the Managing Director of the Starting Point Project, which defends the Christian worldview. And he is also the President of Logos Research Associates. Jay has been speaking on the authority of Scripture for over 38 years. Welcome to the program, Jay. Great to be on the show. We're going to be looking at beyond the facts. What could be beyond the facts? <laughs> well, I didn't think there was anything beyond that when I was younger. but. There's a lot of information we can learn about defending the Christian worldview and it has a lot to do with facts, but to really be an effective communicator, we need to learn to be able to go beyond that in addition to, to be able to get through to people and help them understand things better. And I usually say, don't be a fax machine. <laughs> and what I really mean is don't be a fax machine, just spewing facts. Been there, done that. Mm. When I first started studying everything 38 years ago in college, uh, I learned a lot of facts and couldn't wait to share them and in a sense spew them kindly mm. uh, on other people thinking it would change their minds and it really was not an effective approach. And so uh, this show is going to be all about you know, taking those facts but then going beyond that to mm. have effective communication. And so we're not saying there's something beyond truth or there are facts beyond facts, but we're talking about how we present it in a way that actually would be more effective. Right, how we present it. So mm. we'll get started with that. All right, let's get started. One of the reasons we can't just throw facts out there has to do with this, that facts don't speak for themselves. They have to be interpreted to really have any kind of meaning. For example, we might weigh a rock and find out it's 15 pounds. That's just a fact. What does that mean? Does that mean it's heavy? Does it mean it's light? You know, it needs to be interpreted to give it any kind of meaning. And the way you interpret facts is by using what you already believe, your worldview. Your starting point, the shameless self-promotion or the starting point project because it's all about our starting point. What are we using to interpret these facts? Very, very important. Our starting point as Christians, we believe that God exists and He's the Creator. And secondarily, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. That's our starting point and we use that to define everything else. It's really about the ultimate authority of Scripture. So yes, facts are important, but we need that foundation to interpret these facts. And we don't want to use evidence to conclude that the Bible is true. Many Christians do that. I actually did that for many years starting out a long time ago. But when we do this, we're actually putting evidence in authority over the Bible saying it's because of these truths that we know the Bible is true. Well, we're giving them authority then over God's word and that would mean theoretically maybe new evidence would show that the Bible is not the inspired word of God or the same evidence being interpreted differently would show that the Bible's not the inspired Word of God. So we don't want to use this approach. We want to use the Bible to properly understand or interpret the evidence, including facts from biology, astronomy, and geology as we're talking about creation and evolution. Another point beyond the facts, choose your words very carefully. This is important in many areas of life, but certainly defending the Christian worldview. Here's an example. Uh, some Christians and creationists would say there are no transitional forms. 
years ago, I actually would say something like this. And I actually believe there aren't any transitional forms because I don't believe that Darwinian evolution is true, so you wouldn't have the transitions. But when we make a statement like this, the skeptic might jump all over it and say, well, we've got Archaeopteryx, Tiktaalik, and maybe they'll have a few other examples. And anyone listening in would say, well, he showed that Christian, he's uninformed, doesn't really know anything about evolution or science. So a better option would be to say, according to evolution, there should be an immense number of transitional forms, but all that exists is a handful of questionable examples. And that's true. The examples they bring up are very questionable, and there are reasons why they don't really count. But we can say, fine, we'll, we'll give you those questionably, but we should be drowning in these things if evolution was true. That's a better way of approaching that. Another claim, mutations do not create new information. Again, this was something I said many years ago, but I've refined my approach. Better option is to say mutations do not provide the type and amount of information required by evolution even if granted multiplied millions and millions of years. This is a very, very important point. We'll go into just some details briefly. I'm on the board of directors of Logos Research Associates. It's probably the world's largest consortium of scientists who are six-day creationists. The founder of the group, Dr. John Sanford and Dr. John Baumgartner, along with two other scientists, wrote a paper called The Waiting Time Problem. And it was all focused on how long would we have to wait for mutations to create the amount and type of information required by evolution? Jump into the end of the story. They calculated it would, even if you gave the evolutionist 3,000 times more the amount of time they want, they want 6 million years to go from an ape-like creature to a human. You give them 3,000 amount that time, 18 billion years, they could still only produce 0.000027% of what's needed. This is screaming, even if you want to rely on mutations, it's not going to happen. And Jay, from that, uh, that conclusion is drawing from the rate and what we actually see, how mutations happen, how often they happen. Yeah, there are, simu there are uh, software programs simulated what's actually going on in creatures when they reproduce real mutational rates, and then they use that to ask the question, how long would it take to get what's required by evolution? So you're taking observable results that we can see right now and saying this is a fact and yeah. putting it in that context. Latest I heard, there have been over 10,000 downloads of this publication. It was in a secular publication. There have been over 10,000 downloads. The number of people tried to refute it, zero. Wow. <laughs> Very powerful mm. argument. Another tip beyond the facts. The topic of the age of the earth, it's, it's a fascinating topic, but we need to be careful how we approach it. I caution people to not start with the age of the earth. Many, many Christians that I know in creationists, they jump right into it. It can be a can of worms, and it's too difficult, especially for skeptics, let alone Christians, to wrap their head around the concept that maybe the earth isn't billions of years old. There's a lot of powerful evidence for a, a young earth, but it's a tough topic for, to start with, and if you start with that, you're probably not going to get beyond that, and you'll never get to the gospel message. So I say don't start with that, and we're not really going to talk about flat earth. I'm going to make an important point related to this, but before we do that, a little bit of humor. I saw this. The only thing that flat earthers fear is fear itself. <laughs> I thought that's clever. <laughs> Even if I was a flat earther, I would have to admit this is this is sure. good humor. So well, they say that we're all flat earthers if we don't believe in billions of years. We so. get connected with that concept, <laughs> unfortunately. But my point is, when someone brings up the idea of flat Earth, where is the focus? The focus is on the shape of the Earth. Is it flat or is it spherical? When someone says young Earth creationist or old Earth creationist, where is the focus? The focus is on the age of the earth. Well, guess what? The age of the earth isn't really the thing that's that important. There isn't one age that's more spiritual than another. It's really connected to the concept of death. How did death get into this world? When did it get here? Your belief on this will drive what you believe about the age of the earth. And it has to do with a question that everyone needs to answer for themselves, taking us back to the garden. We know for a fact there are many layers in the earth, and these layers are filled with billions of fossils. That's just a fact. 
Atheists know that. Christians know that. We also know for a fact that fossils represent death, disease, pain, and suffering. There were creatures that were living at one point, died, and got buried. That's just a fact. So, Jay, you're not talking about how long those layers take to lay down or, or what might have caused it. We're just saying, hey, we see layers, and there's skeletons in those layers, fossils in those layers. Everybody can agree. That's just that. a fact. At that point, no one disagrees. We're all in agreement on that. The question comes in then, how did this happen? How did we get those layers with billions of dead things in it? If we conclude that God just used natural processes over billions of years to form those layers, natural history, that means those creatures were living and dying, eating each other. We actually have evidence of cancer and dinosaur bones. If that was God's process, then apparently when it was done, then God planted a garden in the top, put Adam and Eve in it, and they're saying, oh, this is such a perfect world. Well, that would make God responsible for death, disease, pain, and suffering because he did all that before Adam and Eve were even here. On the other hand, if we believe those layers were laid down catastrophically in a flood, that makes man responsible. Adam and Eve sinned, got kicked out of the garden, brought death and a curse into God's creation. Romans 5.12, it was by Adam's sin that brought death into the world. That makes a big difference. So the question is, is what we're seeing, these layers with dead things in it, is that just a snapshot of God's process of creation? Yeah, this is just how he did it over millions of years. Or is this a graphic picture of God's judgment on sin? Mankind's sin brought all that death and it required Jesus Christ to come and die on a cross. Very important question. And when you think of the statement that Scripture makes at the end of God's creation process, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And that's after he made Adam and Eve, which if we're looking at that from that evolutionist viewpoint, then all, you know, death is very good. Cancer is very good. Suffering is very good. I think that's a significant point. We'll have to stop right there, Jay, and, and be back uh, after these messages. Stay with us. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Jay Siegert, who's been sharing about Beyond the Facts. Jay, why is it important that we go beyond the facts and, and really worry about how we present things? There's a lot of information we can learn about defending the Christian worldview, and it has a lot to do with facts, but to really be an effective communicator, we need to learn to be able to go beyond it, in addition to to be able to get through to people and help them understand things better. And, and so we're not saying there's something beyond truth or there are facts beyond facts, but we're talking about how we present it in a way that actually would be more effective. Right. Well, it's really the meaning behind the facts and how we convey them. And in this particular topic that we've been discussing, you know, the, in a sense, the age of the earth, which we conveyed, it's really more about the idea of death. Uh, I presented this segment in different talks uh, as I travel around the country and, and out of the country. But I've had a number of pastors come up to me afterwards and they say, hey, when you had that graphic up there of all the layers in the earth and everything, they said, I never thought about that before. And I really appreciate their transparency, but it's a little surprising that, you know, going through seminary and then leading a church, and these are actually great churches, you know, they're not the extreme liberal churches, very solid churches. But I think typically what happens is in seminary, they can be taught, there are different views on Genesis, uh, smart people on both sides and all sides. It doesn't really matter. It's too divisive, too controversial. We're just here to focus on Jesus so we can stay away from that. 
So if anyone approaches them saying, hey, we should have a creation seminar, they say, no, there are different views, it's too divisive, too controversial, it doesn't really matter, we're just here to focus on Jesus. So it doesn't really compel them to look into it deeper. When they see things like this, they realize this, this actually does matter, it's very significant. And that's because the Bible says that the creation is good, right? At the end of each day, it's good, it's good, it's good, and very good. And, and this question really gets at uh, the connotations and the consequences of your position. Because, I, I, you know, at seminary, I can say it's exactly what you said, that, you know, the day age view, the ascensionist view, the literal view, or whatever it is, um, that view, the, all the views are sort of, you know, well, everybody has their own view, and let's just affirm creation in some sense, let's affirm Adam in some sense and get to the gospel right away. And I've come across the question or, or the separation of, well, you can have animal death, but that's not the same. And that animal death maybe was natural, you know, people eat animals and that might have been the case before the fall. And I remember uh, even having someone say, well, you know, when, when an elephant walks across the ground, he's going to kill ants even before the fall. And so, uh, you know, this idea that, well, Death is natural. How do you deal with that? Well, a lot of different angles we could approach that with. Uh, the Bible uses the word nephesh for the breath of life that God instilled into human beings and into animals, but it doesn't use that term for plants. And even insects aren't really described as being alive in the sense that we are you know, self-aware. Uh, so whether or not an elephant stepped on an ant, it wouldn't really even address you know, the death issue. But also God says in Genesis 1:29 and 30 that God gave the green plants to the field as food for all of his creatures. They were vegetarian in the original creation, but in the fossil record, we have evidence of animals eating other animals. We have evidence of cancer and tumor and dinosaur bones. If that was part of God's original creation plan, when he restores everything, like in Revelation 22, apparently the new creation could have death, disease, pain and suffering, cancer, tumors, and all that, because if that's what his original one was and he's gonna restore it, we should expect that or not be surprised by it. It's not really about what God could have done. He's all powerful. It's about what did he tell us he did. He tells us that he made it perfect. Adam and Eve sinned. That brought a curse in and all of creation groans, not just mankind, but all of creation groans because of the curse. But the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the solution in the new creation. That curse is going to be lifted. You know, there are scriptures that talk about God's concern for the animals, even in laws that he gave to Israel, how they were not to be cruel to an animal in the way they yoked it or not to take the mother with the young and so forth. Or, or even the idea that man himself is not given permission to eat the animals till after Noah's flood. Genesis chapter 9, 1 through 3, God says, hey, remember how you ate all the plants? He goes, now I give you any, everything. They could eat meat. They were allowed to eat meat after the flood. But prior to that, God's mandate was that they were all vegetarian. I think it is a, a more biblical position to say that death in any sense doesn't enter into creation until the fall. Because when God restores, he says there will, there will be no more suffering, you know, no more sorrow, no more pain, cancer and no more death. And so uh, how that couldn't extend to the animal kingdom seems difficult to me. Definitely. So, One more step beyond the facts, a little bit of a practical advice that this should be useful to everyone. Uh, two keys to effective engagement. There are a lot of keys, just two that I'm gonna bring up now. Listening and asking questions. And it sounds easy, but it's a skill that I had to learn. I was so eager to just to tell everyone what I knew I didn't take time to listen to what they were saying and why they believed it. Uh, my wife has helped me with this quite a bit, to actually listen to the skeptic first and then ask follow-up questions about what they believe before I even started to say anything. You know, and I, I think that does something on another level too, you know, as a minister, I mean, we're supposed to care about people. And if I'm just going to boom, 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 you know, throw my answers at you and then move on, I mean, that, the person knows I don't care about them. I don't care about what they think. I just have this inner need to throw everything I know at them and then I move on to the next thing and really it's all about me at that point. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, to do what you just said, to ask questions, well, I have to really care about this person, get to know this person and isn't that part of what we should be doing when we're talking to unbelievers is loving our neighbors, right? right. We shouldn't just have an, an agenda to win an argument. We should be caring about them. This is a spiritual issue. They're spiritually blinded. We need to care for them and eventually get as quickly as we can to that gospel message. Mm. So the scenario I'm going to take you through is a typical scenario of a conversation a Christian might have with a skeptic. We'll go through it and then we'll also revisit it, but a lot of people might relate to this. 
the skeptic's going to make some bold claims. Uh, evolution is a fact, and the Bible is just mythology. Christian typically would say, well, I don't believe that. I think creation is true, and the Bible is the inspired word of God. Skeptic says, fine, prove it. Give me one fact, just one fact that proves creation is true or that the Bible is truly from God. Well, I can't really prove it, but that's what I believe. Just as I suspected, well, you can have your faith, but I live in the real world and I'm sticking with science. <laughs> you, you got that pretty accurate, at least from what I've seen. That's what happens. So the Christian is humiliated, they're embarrassed, mm. they're thinking, I don't ever want that to happen again. I'm going to do whatever it takes to avoid that scenario. Well, let's try this again. We're going to go through this conversation. The skeptic's going to make the same claims they made before, but this time we're going to change how the Christian responds. And all the Christian is going to do is ask follow-up questions, which anyone can do. Yeah. It doesn't require you to have a degree in physics or archaeology, Greek and Hebrew. You listen and you ask questions. So, skeptics making the same claim. Evolution is a fact and the Bible is just mythology. Christian, what do you mean by evolution? They use the word evolution. You're showing you heard that. You're asking for a clarification. What do you mean by that? Well, that life arose from chemicals billions of years ago and slowly evolved into every life form we see today. Okay. How do you know evolution is a fact? They mentioned it was a fact. You're asking follow-up question. Well, all the scientists believe it. How do you know that all the scientists <laughs> believe it? Well, all real scientists believe it. Which is even an admission, right? I think most people will admit that there are scientists who don't believe in evolution, and you know, I mean, but even that point shows that what they said, you know, these sweeping assertions, and, and I think that's what you're showing, right? That, that really uh, the objector is guilty of a lot of fallacies that um, they're not really seeing. And one of the things we can do by doing this is helping them to see, you know, what you're saying really isn't true, even without even considering the end of the arguments here. You're making some, some mistakes. Yeah, it's called yeah. elephant hurling when they say, well, all the scientists believe it. It's backed up by evidence from every area. So they said, and all the real scientists believe it. So then you ask, well, how do you, how do you define a real scientist? Um, anyone who believes in evolution. <laughs> well, isn't that circular reasoning? Yes. Which is, it, it is, and you could keep moving. And they often do that with us. Well, how do you know that God exists? Well, the Bible says so. How do you know that the Bible says so? Well, because God exists. And, yeah. you know, and, and so it's, it's neat to throw back a circular reasoning charge because they are doing it. Yes. And then they'll say, well, you believe that God created everything magically out of nothing in six days and made Adam and Eve in some mystical garden. Yeah, that's really believable. <laughs> this is where you say, actually, I haven't said anything about what I believe. You, however, have made some very serious claims, and I'm simply asking you to give me some reasons why you believe they're true. So that's a really important step there. You're, the person's trying to shift you know, the, the pressure, throw all these assertions that the person has never made, I haven't said anything. And yet. then suddenly, you know, sometimes I think that as a Christian, we make the mistake of getting back on our heels and whoa, whoa, whoa. And we try to explain ourselves where they really haven't answered any of the questions that we've asked them. Very important. So then you say, so why do you believe the Bible is just mythology? That was the second thing they said. Because it's full of errors and contradictions. Could you give me some examples? Well, there are tons of them. I don't really need tons of examples. Just one or two would be a good start. Yeah. Well, I uh, can't think of any right now. Could you tell me the general storyline of the Bible from beginning to end? Just one minute over you. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at it. Tell me, if you can't think of any actual errors or contradictions, and you don't even know what the Bible is all about, why do you have such a strong opinion against mm. it? Are you sure you're not simply repeating what you've heard from someone else as opposed to your own well-thought-out research? And you want to do this very graciously yes, and yes. kindly. You don't want to be sarcastic, but yeah. you want to get them to realize they're making a lot of bold claims with virtually nothing to back it up. And it's, it's hard because we are, I mean, a lot of times we do get animosity, condescension, you know, uh, mocking even in the questions. And you really have to like, I mean, I think a big part of this that we're not talking about is prayer. I mean, we really need to pray that God gives us the grace, right, to not only love that person, but to give, to give a real answer uh, with, uh, what's Paul say, uh, uh, or Peter says, you know, with um, uh, respect and, and fear. Yes. You know, we, we really, we want to give an answer, but we want to give an answer that, that shows who we are as Christians, that we, we do love our neighbors, and even when they do evil to us, we do good back to them. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Mm. So we'll wrap up with this. What, what if they do have answers? Because this scenario was that they didn't really have answers. What if they do have answers? Well, you qualify them. My wife has helped me with this as mm. well, and this is what it looks like. You ask them, are these top reasons why you don't believe in whatever you're discussing? Existence of God, creation, Jesus. If they say no, 
could we temporarily set these aside and you tell me what your top reasons are? If they say yes, if you were to find out that these are invalid reasons, would you be willing to hear more about Jesus, God, Bible, creation, whatever you're talking and, about? And that's good too, because if they say no, then why waste my time? Then they're know? not being serious, but yeah. if they say yes, you got your homework cut out for you mm -hmm. and you need to go find them answers. Mm -hmm. So there's so much more than just spewing facts at people. We really need to be more well-rounded and if people don't see Christ in us, nothing we say is gonna matter. And, and you know, here is we're looking towards the goal. The goal is not just me winning an argument, me showing what I know, but me getting someone to really think about the eternal consequences of what they believe or don't believe. And, you know, that's what we should be about as Christians. Jay, thanks for being on the program. My pleasure. We're out of time, so hopefully you can be back with us again sometime. You know, as Christians, we affirm truth, facts, and reality. We do not believe all is relative or that there is no such thing as truth or that we couldn't know it even if there was. Reality exists. Truth is real. It's recognizable. In fact, it's undeniable. But those facts by themselves don't actually say anything. When defending the Bible or the Christian faith, we need to listen to the objector. We need to ask questions and see if we can't allow the truth that they already know by the common grace of God to be brought home to them by the saving grace of God. And you know, it just goes to show you that we do know in the end that the Bible is true and the proof, it's, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. It's by your support prayerfully and financially that we're able to make these programs and, and they are by the grace of God making a big impact. And so let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator really is. And, and we'll see you next time on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2306, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.